So uh, I'll turn it over now to our our guests from uh, CRS and let them tell a little bit more about what they do and uh, an overview on their specific program. Sure thing. And thanks again for having us. I think this is a great series. And I'm Billy Ranello. I'm a physical therapist with CRS out of the Homewood office. Um, I've been with the agency almost 20 years now in kind of a couple different roles. So um, just excited to kind of come talk and get the information out about the services we provide. Um, and Ashley, we can go ahead to the next one. So again, we see her as we're an agency within the Department of Rehab. We have a sister agency, the CIEI, the RNC. We are at the end of our first to 21 arm of that department that's basically here to set up specialty medical care and clinics and services for family and children and youth with special health care needs. Um, we run a series of clinics throughout the state through our 14, 14 district offices. Um, the different clinics offered uh, kind of vary based on the needs of that region in that area of the state. Uh, there are some consistent ones across the state, especially if they are non-physician led in our evaluation clinics. Uh, but for the most part, we are setting up kind of clinics for what that need is based on that area of the state. We do receive um, government funding and federal funding that we match with some state dollars in order to kind of help the program go. Um, as far as eligibility for CRS, any child birth to 21 with a special health care need is eligible some way, shape, or form. Um, that may look different depending on the child's diagnosis and how we can help with their needs. Um, every child is eligible for care coordination and assistance, any consultation with our disciplined staff. Uh, you know, attendance to our specialty medical clinics is sometimes based on diagnosis. Um, as we do have specific clinics, and we'll get into those in just a sec. We do have one kind of special little arm of CRS that works with adults uh, over the age of 21, and that's through our hemophilia program. And that's set up decades ago through legislation with the state to have a program readily available for children and adults with hemophilia in the state, and we kind of help run that program. Um, our goal through our services, regardless of a family's income, they are able to access our services. Um, and again, that definition of children and youth with special health care needs, that special health care needs uh, definition from the federal government is very broad. Um, we tend to work with our kiddos who have kind of the most intense medical needs um, in that area of special health care needs. Uh, we do have financial eligibility, which we'll go into in a minute, uh, that allows us to directly spend funds. So, you know, part of our program is to also look at any community funding or outside funding, too, to help those families where we may not be able to directly pay. Um, in 2023, they just kind of came out with our stats and all that fun stuff. Uh, we served over 15,000 children and youth with special health care needs, and then almost another additional 500 through our hemophilia program. So again, what kind of qualifies uh, for CRS and especially for the AT services? Um, qualification for CRS, uh, when we're looking at how they're able to access the assistive technology, again, we have to have the families and the children enrolled in our program. Um, we do kind of take intake and screener calls from physicians and community therapists, but families can also call themselves and refer and see if there are services within our agency that they can qualify for and we can assist with. Um, typically that discussion of needs and that first contact person for a family or even a care provider in our system as a care coordinator, which is a social worker um, by training, uh, that kind of helps coordinate different areas of services for the families. Uh, we divide up our care coordinators based on uh, zip code. So we, each district offices kind of has a care coordinator assigned for particular areas. We also divide up our care coordinators based on age and caseload with birth to 12 and 13 being the, the young caseload. And then that 12, 13 and older being transition caseloads in most of our offices so we can help with that transition of care 
into adulthood and also in rural, rural, rural agencies, agencies, agencies uh, uh, that still as, as, as our kids get older. Um, we do uh, for our children who are in our program that have uh, specific medical diagnoses, for example, spina bifida, cerebral palsy, uh, limb deficiency, or amputee. Uh, we do have specific medical-based clinics, which is a multidisciplinary clinic, but they're physician-led. Uh, and that's where the families can tap back into the state for resources in that medical care, but also any assistance uh, with payment of services recommended out of those clinics. And this extends uh, through cleft lip, cleft palate, um, through hearing clinics, et cetera. Uh, for, we also have an evaluation clinic arm uh, of CRS that is basically our uh, discipline staff-led clinics, not, necessar not necessarily doctor-led clinics. And these are our main assistive technology clinics where we're looking at seating positioning mobility as far as wheelchairs, walkers, adaptive ADL equipment. It is our ACT clinic, our augmentative communication and technology clinic where we're looking at adaptive communication devices, whether low-tech or high-tech. Uh, an example like our feeding clinic is at not only feeding recommend, recommendations for any difficulties a child may have, but there are additional um, equipment and AT that may help in feeding as well. Um, basically through our clinical program and with that access, once you're hooked up with that clinic team, uh, we then follow up with the local providers of that equipment, our staff do, whether it's the local DME provider or um, regional companies sometimes with augmented communication devices to help complete all the necessary paperwork for that equipment, obtain prescriptions, do letters of justification, all of that fun stuff to get it ordered. We would then, for those families that qualify for us financially, can directly expend CRS funds uh, for some of that eligible equipment. So in general, kind of what type of assistive technology what are we doing through our clinics? Um, it kind of ranges per clinic. Again, um, our clinics like Augmentative Communication Technology Clinic, very much communication related, where we're looking at low-tech, high-tech devices. We're looking at mounts. Um, there are times we bring in our rehab engineers through the department to help custom build some items for us. If we're looking at different um, maybe mounting systems or placements of a device. But we also are very big kind of with ADO and adaptive feeding equipment, as well as positioning and mobility equipment, um, looking for adaptive equipment to assist the family and that child through their daily routine. As far as our ADO and adaptive equipment, uh, we're very much looking at adaptive utensils, bath and shower equipment, adaptive toileting equipment, dressing aids, feeding aids. You know, these range from, you know, curved handle spoons all the way up to OB feeding devices from you know, your, your basic shower bench that you may also find at the CVS or Walmart, all the way up to your, your, your transfer style bath systems that could be you know, upwards of $5,000. In regards to positioning mobility, we're looking at all forms of mobility from you know, needing, if it's just minor assistance through canes and a walker, up through gate trainers, to power and manual chairs, even adaptive strollers, and patient lifts. Uh, we will evaluate through our clinic as well for standards and other equipment. Um, even if there are equipment that our agency doesn't directly pay for, we will help the family with those evaluations, with ordering the equipment, with doing all the justification. Um, we just may not be a payment piece on those particular systems. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. And then again, with our... Um, Limb deficiency, MPT clinics, you know, in the AT world, we're also looking at prosthetics, orthotics, and then through our hearing clinics, we assist with hearing aid management and ordering as well. So mm -hmm. um, our goal is that we can help from the front end of the eval to the end of delivery and to be there for kind of continuing support as needed. Got it. That's great. Is there a funding limit? Is there a funding limit? There is not. Um, you know, a lot of our limitations are whether we're directly purchasing for a family or whether we're indirectly finding community resources and funds. Mm -hmm. As far as our direct CRS funding purchasing, if it's an item recommended out of a CRS clinic and the family falls in our eligible copay range, and those are all some federal guidelines set down to us, and there's an example here, if it is a piece of equipment that CRS is able to purchase, we are then 
you know, we, we want to be your payer of last resort, but if it is an item that maybe insurance doesn't purchase, CRS will directly purchase it. So okay. you know, here's just an example on family income. You know, our highest assistance level is the 300% federal poverty income level. So again, an example is a family of four's taxable income. So after you've taken out all your deductions, done all your stuff, this is usually that main um, taxable income item that's on your second page of your tax form. Uh, if you're in that $78,000 to $93,000 range for a family of four of taxable income, we can be a direct payer for items that we're eligible to purchase out of our clinic. And this includes, I know we're talking AT here, but this also includes medicines and nutritional supplements and those kind of things too that are recommended out of our clinics for our families. Again, we're going to seek insurance funding whenever we can. We want to be the payer of last resort. So there are times we are a family's backup payer to say they're $40,000 power chair to their Blue Cross and Blue Cross pays maybe 75, 80% and CRS picks up the difference. Um, you know, there are times when items are completely denied by insurance or not covered. For example, bath and toileting equipment, no matter your insurance in Alabama, it's considered a convenience item. So we've decided through the years to keep that as equipment that we cover because it's needed for our families. Um, so those are things that once they're ordered to a CRS clinic, we turn around and a family is financially eligible, we turn around and directly pay for those items. Uh, in regards to items that we cannot directly pay for, uh, which there are some examples here like portable ramps, external carriers for car, sometimes our low-tech communication options because um, when you submit to insurance, sometimes that's your equipment for a five-year period and we necessarily, with communication devices, if we're doing buttons or switches or your, your beginning communication type systems, we may not want to utilize a child's insurance for that and knowing that they may outgrow that in four or five years. So we do work closely with community funding options. Uh, a big one around Birmingham and Alabama is called Libby's Friends. Uh, there are also individual family support councils throughout the state for different regions and Easter sales funding options throughout the state that will help a family complete those applications so we can then, and we'll submit our notes and justification so we then can maybe get those items purchased for the family if we're not directly using CRS funding. Um, as far as an overall limit for a child or a family, there, there is not a limit, uh, you know, the, the main, there is not a monetary limit. The main limit is that it is an item recommended out of a CRS clinic that's an eligible item for us to purchase and assist with. Now, that being said, just like every other office and every other agency, there is a departmental budget and there's an office budget that we have to stay within quarterly, but there's not necessarily a limit of, hey, we cannot do X, Y, Z that is eligible for us to purchase and that's what that child needs at this time. Mm -hmm. simply because a, pers a patient themselves or a consumer themselves has a limit on their funding. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. One of the, one of the things that I've seen, that seen uh, families and uh, consumers... Uh, consumers. Oh, You're not muted. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Kevin. We can go ahead, Kevin, just hop in if there are any questions, please. But uh, a process, just going through the process for consumers, it's really getting enrolled and contacting the agency to see how we may could help. Again, through our public website, there are contact pages and ways for uh, um, families to contact a general contact line that goes to our state office and then gets divvied out to each office. You can also search the local offices based on your county you reside in. Um, to see what your local district office is and that contact info. Um, also through the public website, just like any state agency, there's a way to send a general email to a general email account that then gets distributed out to the districts for questions. Um, we do have times and I mean, we do have families that may call and you know their needs may be more education related or mental health related. And that's when, you know, maybe CRS may not directly enroll you, but we will help get you to the right agency or the right department or the right group to help you. Again, if you are that child with that special health care need, and that's a very broad definition in Alabama, ranging from 
asthma to cerebral palsy to you know amputation um you are eligible to contact our office and you know have access to parent consultants care coordinators you know we just may not have a clinic for every diagnosis but again please call and see if that's something that may be helpful um, i think the biggest process for consumers too is you know you're usually linked up to a medical provider or specialist and you're usually linked up to therapists that may be working with you out in the community you know bring up crs and see if you think it may be beneficial for your family um, and for your child uh, or if you're working as a, a therapist or a related service provider in the community is it you know something that would be beneficial for a family you're working with again when a family comes to our clinic there's no cost you know there's no copay there's no any of this um, it is a multidisciplinary clinic uh, we describe it to families it's kind of like you're going to walmart and you're going to do all your shopping from tires to kleenex to you know vegetables and everything and fruit so you can kind of have a one-stop shop um, if looking at those type of needs Oh, this is good stuff. Oh, good stuff. This is great. Great. And then again, the, the process is very much the same for community service providers. It's knowing kind of your local CRS office and how to get in touch with them. If you do get in contact with them, it is um, looking at um, what area and what district is covered by what office and then also what individuals in that office are covering that system. Um, a lot of our referrals come from our connections to, you know, specifically me as a physical therapist, to school or other community therapists that are working with the child and they know, hey, we need to get them evaluated for XYZ piece of equipment. Let's get them referred over to CRS or if they're already in the system, let's get them referred to the appropriate clinic they need to come to to get further evaluated. Because again, we try to then follow up on those local referrals and talk to that uh, family once we get that contact information from y'all as local service providers. Um, I think one thing for service providers, too, um, now that our website is a little bit more up to date and there are some items on it uh, through the Department of Rehab is looking through on the CRS page at the bottom, there are brochures um, and other kind of fact sheets for our services uh, that you're able to hand out to families or print and having your clinic. Hopefully, fingers crossed, in the next little bit. There'll be some fillable enrollment forms that would be on the website that family you could then print out and hand to a family uh, that they could then go ahead and start that enrollment paperwork process. Maybe sometime in the near future, we'll have some electronic submission of those forms. But those are kind of the ways for providers to kind of help get families linked up to the system. And then again, when we're looking at what happens with our teams and how we support once you're you're you know referred to crs you're in the clinic we've seen you we are then as that clinic team going to follow up with that local provider and that family uh, once they leave clinic because again it's not very helpful if you know your your ten thousand dollar communication device if you're only shown it that one time and there's no support afterwards um you know also part of our evaluation process is linking up with those local providers to know that there's that network after receiving equipment that there can be training out in the community through them as well um, but as we kind of work with our local providers and then our local and regional equipment providers um, i mean we are there kind of as the team to help get the paperwork that's needed to order the equipment to look at insurance and get any help with any screen information doing the justification and then assisting with the delivery and any kind of ongoing training or support for that equipment. Um, you know, we do tend to see kiddos kind of in burst as they have those needs and may work very closely with them for a few months as we're getting everything ordered and in and done. But we're also in there as the in-between to kind of fill those gaps and do some community wraparound visits, trainings, those things for providers and the families. Uh, so once you have it, we're still a network there to help provide you support. Okay, I think we're ready. Um, if anyone has any questions, I know that there's one in the. Um, I saw one pop up in the chat for over 21. Um, and I think 
that's where we'll get you know some discussions here later on with some of our other sister agencies in the department about how that assistance is available too. Um, again, if you're over 21 and have hemophilia, you're still linked into our program, but uh, after 21 non-hemophilia, that's when you kind of graduate from our uh, agency. Okay. Any other any other questions um, from the group? From the group. All right. Well, we're well, hearing none. Um, we uh, we certainly appreciate your time in joining us today. I, I know I've learned a lot. So um, again, thank you. And uh, if no one has any more questions, uh, we can turn it over to our friends at Boat Rehab and let them explain a little bit more about uh, their program and services. Well, I'm Javita Yao, and I am a vocational rehabilitation counselor with the Alabama Department of Rehab Services here in the Hollywood office. And here's my partner. I'm Jonathan Sanders. I'm also a vocational rehabilitation counselor here in the Hollywood office. Um, we're going to discuss with you the overview of our services. I know Billy mentioned that um, children's rehab goes to about 21, with some exceptions. Uh, we typically pick up individuals who are in high school, um, starting around the age of 14, and we service individuals um, through the rest of their life. Um, we assist people uh, in obtaining and maintaining gainful employment and providing services uh, to those individuals in order to help them obtain their goals. What qualifies a consumer for AT services? It has to be, they have to be enrolled with vocational rehab and have a case open. And then we have to see that they need assistive te technology in order to perform the duties of their job. And usually with that, we do we refer them to a, a rehab engineer. And once we get recommendations from there, then we move forward with helping with the technology. process for a consumer is if we're talking about a school system, typically uh, those consumers, students are referred by uh, the school system to us and then we go to one of our transition counselors um, and they would be the provider for that services. If we're talking about an adult, um, any individual can apply for services. So if you have a documented impediment to employment uh, and you are trying to obtain gainful employment, you can call us and depending on your zip code or, you know, if you're receiving treatment from a facility or for, through an other provider, sometimes they get filtered out those different ways. You just call us, and, uh, we get you to the right counselor, and then we take an application, uh, obtain those documents to make sure that you're eligible for services, and then we can actually provide services to assist you in obtaining your employment goals. And then you go through our process in order to get that. Our process is once you um, open an application with us and you're el deemed eligible for services, we develop a plan with you. And if it's discussed during the plan that you need assistive technology, then we refer you out to our rehab engineer. They do an evaluation and provide for us a report with recommendations. And then we pick up from, from there, like I said before, with what their recommendations are and going through and purchasing um, that equipment for you. So what type of AT is eligible through the program? Uh, like Javita mentioned just a second ago, if assistive technology is something that the consumer and I, the VR counselor, feel can benefit them, we do refer them to the rehab engineer. The rehab engineer knows what services are out there as far as what vendors we work with um, and how to access those services. Uh, we do have uh, vendors, providers who are on our, um, uh, who are a approved vendor through us that we can purchase directly through them. Sometimes we have to go through what's called a revolving fund uh, in order to get those services. Uh, as far as that, what AT is eligible, um, 
pretty much anything that the rehab engineer recommends. I, we are not trained in that. Um, the rehab engineer is our point of contact. Uh, they have all that knowledge and special training for that. And so they make the recommendations for us. Just to step on to what John was saying, and within the slides, some of the items that we help with purchasing um, include like the Dragon software, which basically what that is, is you can speak and it'll type up what you're trying to say. We've also done ergonomic keyboards, uh, chairs. We've done a high-tech um, wheelchair lift in someone's house, as well as an evac chair that somebody used on their job. So those are just different types of examples. Okay, how funding is provided. Really what we do is if you are 20 or under 23, we have to obtain a parent's tax information. So basically we utilize a sliding fee scale that is based upon your tax information. And like I said before, if you're under 23, we have to utilize parents' tax information tax information. If you're over 23, then we utilize your tax information. Um, we also, if you get Social Security, you automatically qualify at 100%. But usually it's looking at the taxes, plugging in the numbers, and seeing where you fall on our scale. So who provides support in selecting and or implementing the assistive technology? That would be our rehab engineers. Uh, when we uh, when they provide that evaluation for us and for the consumer, we take back that information and the rehab engineers will recommend the providers. Uh, we, we as a VR counselors will purchase those items based on sliding scale eligibility. Uh, they sometimes get delivered to us. They sometimes get delivered to the consumer. It just depends on um, what's most feasible. Uh, for instance, I had a uh, a consumer that worked from home, so it was just easier to have the items delivered there, and then we would meet at the delivery site uh, at the home, and, and the uh, rehab engineer and uh, their assistant would, would probably help set that up um, and actually go through the process of implementing those strategies. Uh, I would be there more just to make sure that everything got there okay and that there's anything missing or if the consumer needs any assistance with kind of handling the, the, the stressors and strains of, of new technology, that's kind of where I come into play in, in that role. And to make sure that, that, oh, well, we got this in, but, you know, maybe there's a better device because, you know, we might, the rehab engineer might recommend something um, and then we think it's great, the consumer thinks it's great, engineer thinks it's great, we get out there and it's just really not a great fit. So then we kind of have to go back to the drawing board, but we have a better idea and better information at the time. But a lot of times uh, the rehab engineer will, you know, if we're talking about specialized uh, mouse or ergonomic keyboard, a lot of times they'll be able to get, bring them in and say, hey, which of these is better for your workflow in those situations? And so we're, we're, they do a really good job of getting it right, right off the bat. Any questions for us? Oh, there's one. Okay. Um, okay. Maybe not. This is th this was posted. Um, actually posted as to where you can find the um, local ADRS offices. Um, I don't see any more in the in the chat here. Um, but let me scroll down just to make sure. Yeah, we are statewide. Um, so. Every county in the state is covered. Uh, not necessarily there's a, a person housed in every county, but we are in every county. Okay, great. Any other any other questions? This has been very informative, um, and thanks for attending. We really appreciate it. Um, so that being said, the the final program. Uh, to, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I know we talked about accommodations for like the work site or at home, but in actuality too, there's a third one and that's like driving. So if you uh, needed vehicular okay. modifications, that's also something that we can
And those guys are evaluated through our Lakeshore office. Okay. So it's the Lakeshore office that does the driving evaluations and oh, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay. Any other any other questions? Well, thanks again for attending. We really appreciate it. And uh, that being said, we'll we'll turn it over now to the third program, uh, which is the uh, sale program, and uh, let them let them take it away. Hi, I'm Lillian Butler, and I am one of the program specialists with the sale division of ADRS. And we have four programs in our division. We have community support services, we have homebound, we have the sale waiver, and we have hybrid services. And a real quick way to explain those the difference in those four programs is that the community support services program sees a need and kind of swoops in and takes care of that need and swoops out. And that program is available to people who are between birth and death, anybody, um, any age group is eligible for that program. And a, a lot of what they do are um, adaptive technology type things and ramps. They do a lot of wheelchair ramps, but they come in, they are the only program that can come in to someone's life when they are still in the hospital. If there's been an event or a, uh, disease progression that requires our services. They can go in and take an application in the hospital and make sure somebody's home is ready for them to come home to. Um, we'll get more into each of these later, but um, the homebound program is for people who are 16 years of age or older and have a qualifying condition such as uh, traumatic brain injury or spinal cord injury that limits their mobility. Um, it is a state program and not governed by federal law. Um, they pro uh, We provide assistive technology in that. Um, the third program is a cell waiver program. That's a federal program, a federal waiver program, and it's governed by federal law. And again, a program where in, we provide assistive technology that's for people who are at least 18 years of age and who, who have had um, whatever their diagnosis is, have had that prior to age 63. And then we have the hybrid program and that is for people who are either in our homebound program, any waiver program in the state, and a VR program, just because we, um, I'm seeing a question there. I'll, st I'll stop and answer that in a second. Um, what was I saying? Um, the waiver pro or the hybrid program is for people who have a VR program, either a homebound program or any waiver program, because we see those people really often and um, can, or kind of expert at braiding those funds to help somebody achieve their work goals and their goals of independence at home. Um, the question about that, the ramp question, somebody has to be um, in one of our programs. So they would have to qualify for our program. They can't just call our referral line and somebody goes out and builds a ramp. Um, and that referral number is 334. I know there's an 800 number, but I'm going to give you this 334 293 7407. 334 293 7407. And you can call there to um, be put on our referral. So, Let's go back to the beginning, the community support services and the kind of, oh, let's go to the next. What is a case manager's process? Okay, so what happens is somebody applies for services and then a case manager goes out to the home. We're the one, or in our division, we do home visits. That's how we provide services. 
So somebody comes to your home and takes an application and makes sure that you meet criteria. And um, once you meet criteria, they sit and make a plan with you of what do you need to become more independent in your home. And in the case of hybrid, to be successful at work as well as independent in your home. And in some cases that would include um, assistive technology. In other cases, it would not include assistive technology. But in order to receive assistive technology, you have to be a participant in one of our programs. So let's go to the next. What type of AT is eligible through the program? I'm going to piggyback on um, vocational rehab to say that really almost anything is is available through the program. But again, we are also a payer of last resort is, is um, I think Billy said about children's rehab services. But generally with community support services, what's available are those ramps and then things to get people started walkers, rollators, um, um, minor assistive technology. Because what we're thinking is if somebody will need major assistive technology, they're probably going to slide into one of our other programs or into another waiver in the state. Um, and usually what is provided through the community support services are things that are not assistive technology, things like uh, medical supplies, um, incontinence supplies, just to get somewhere, just to get someone from where they are, you know, to carry them through until they're in a more substantial program. It Again, it's kind of a swoop in and out situation. Um, that, so that's for, community support services. Then looking at homebound, homebound can provide environmental accessibility adaptations. Um, and please, um, Ashley McElroy, jump in if you want to on any of this. But a lot of what that has to do with is having some kind of technology available to people so that they can operate things from their bed or from their bedroom um, so that they can turn lights on and off, so that they can turn their um, air and heat systems on and off or change the temperatures. Um, one of my favorite environmental accessibility adaptations, I would say, is um, the door openers. So somebody does not sit in their house unlocked at anyone's mercy, you know, to so that people cannot just come in and out of their house. It gives them the autonomy to let people come in who they want to come in and to keep people out who they want to keep out. Um, I can speak on that real quick, Lillian. Okay, well, thank you. I think um, because, you know, years experience of doing the AT evaluations for sale, we focus on assistive technology that can help with health and safety. So as long as it's health and safety related, that's what we were able to recommend for sale consumers, whereas VR, it had to be job related, had to be vacation related, um, and then CRS is medical related. So that's how they mm -hmm. differ a little bit. Right. Thank you. And that is true. Everything we provide has to be health and safety related. Um, minor, in, and it has to give someone the ability to become more independent in their environment, such as letting somebody in or keeping somebody out. That gives them the independence to make those decisions themselves. Um Minor assistive technology, that could be anything. You know, minor assistive technology could be, I think Billy mentioned the utensils um, 
that allow somebody to eat on their own. Um, and th those come in different, um, I guess, those come in different variations. You might have something that wraps around your arm if you don't have hand control. And so that the fork then, you know, is has a this long kind of noodle handle that wraps around your arm so you can eat. Or it might be something that say if you have Parkinson's disease, it would keep the spoon level even if you are uh, shaking so that you can still eat on your own. Those are uh, just two examples of minor assistive technology. Then we have assistive technology, much larger things um, like wheelchairs or um, car modifications. And those are services that are, can all be provided through homebound. And I wanna talk for a second about the, the financial limits of the homebound program. When we talk about um, home modifications, this law was written in the mid 1970s and they actually wrote a dollar figure into the law saying that only $1,000 a year could be spent on home modifications. Well, you know, that won't even build a ramp. And so um, that, bring, thank you for moving forward, but, but I'll go back to that too. But that means we look for a lot of outside funding. We look for um, funding with community partners. We look for funding. We look, we have volunteers that are involved in, in uh, building ramps in particular. We have this wonderful um, engineering team at ADRS. They come in and they make um, very well educated, informed um, suggestions about what needs to be done in order for somebody to be safe in their homes and to have autonomy in their homes. Um, I'm sorry about those things. I keep getting emails. But, um, and so we look to people right now, we even have a project with Habitat for Humanity for one family. We um, are constantly using the reutilization centers such as Easter Seals here in Montgomery, um, the one housed at Christmas Charities year round in Huntsville and throughout the state, those reutilization centers. I wanna talk about this a little bit, but I'll, and I'll go ahead and give you actual figures for the same, it's your funding limit. For the cell waiver, absolutely, there are dollar amounts that are funding limits on things. Environmental accessibility adaptations, $8,500 per lifetime. And that means even if you are in another waiver and you spend $8,000 and you transition to our waiver, you only have $500 left. Um, minor assistive technology, $500 a year. Assistive technology, you know, those bigger things, $25,000 per lifetime. And assistive technology repair is $2,000 per year. And we can only repair things that we bought. Um, what we try to do when we know that there are caps on these items, we really are trying to look for partners to help fund those items prior to us spending money. Of course, you know, there's insurance and that's important with wheelchairs. And, and we know that Medicaid has changed that time frame from every five years you get a new wheelchair to every seven years you get a new wheelchair. And I don't know how that decision was made. I don't think it was made by someone who uses a wheelchair. Um, but we always are looking for other ways to pay for something, especially when we know, well, in homebound, we have that $1,000 
a year limit on home modifications and then waiver when we have all of these yearly and lifetime caps because we want to make sure if something comes up and you need that, the money is still intact. So that is why we are always looking. We're looking for grants. We're looking for um, other sources of payment to help pay for those things. So we, so there, yes, there are limits and yes, we try to strategize so that people can preserve um, the possibility of that. And with, um, when we have somebody who is a vocational rehabilitation client and, and for instance, a cell waiver participant, then what we do is kind of weave the money, you know, braid that money together so that we know what can vocational rehab pay for, what can we pay for, and it all has to do with, as Ashley mentioned before, health and safety for the um, sale money and job related expenses for the um, VR money. And that comes into play a lot when we talk about personal care, but it also comes into play when we talk about um, any of the assistive technology. So what is the next slide? Oh. So what qualifies a participant for AT services is will it, does it relate back to health and safety? If, um, if you just want a ring doorbell for fun, and I actually can't see how that might be fun, but um, then that would not qualify for you to that. We really have to relate everything back to health and safety, and you have to be a participant in one of our programs. So what is next? Okay, the process for a participant. Somebody calls that line, that number, 334-293-7407, which is in the chat, and says that they want to to apply for um, sales services. And then Marquita Sanders, who answers that phone, will ask a lot of questions, including things like, um, do you have Medicaid? Just trying to see which program to send you to. What is your disability? What are your limitations because of that disability? And what services might you be looking for? Um, the overall with, um, the community support services, you just have to have a disability that, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting so, now I'm getting phone calls. Um, you just have to have a disability that limits your ability to be independent in your home. Um, and some of that actually even applies to parents. If there's a small child who, who needs, um, a wheelchair ramp because a parent needs to be able to, you know, to use that ramp, not necessarily the child. So it relates back, it's more holistically and family oriented. But um, so somebody calls and then they give this information and then Marquita thinks, oh, you know, based on our criteria, does this person need to be referred to community support services? Do they need to be, um, referred to the cell waiver, and that would be really for people who um, have Medicaid or look like they're Medicaid eligible, or do people need to be um, referred to the homebound program? Um, and that would be because they don't have Medicaid, they're not, it looks like they won't be Medicaid eligible, or they their date of onset is 63 year old then that, those are kind of how those get divided up. And then once somebody is on the referral list, so I call, I'm on the referral list, 
And then I should expect a telephone call within a few days to say, hey, I know you're here. I'm going to try to set up an appointment with you just as soon as I can. And then somebody comes to your house and takes an application and or in the case of somebody who's in the hospital and has been applied for CSS, somebody will go to the hospital and take an application. And um, and then once an application has been made, we order the medical records, of course, and they come and then somebody comes back out to the house and says, you're eligible for services. Let's talk about what you may need. And a lot of times, right off the bat, that's going to include assistive technology. So, and um, just so you all know, um, I think it was Medicaid, Ashley, you would probably know this, that now we'll put just off the bat, we'll give somebody a lift in their power chair. And that had had been something we were having to pay for, separate and above what insurance, what Medicaid would pay for. But um, let's say who provides support in selecting and or oops, implementing AT. We we have that great engineering team who provides a lot of support in that. At this point, usually our staff is the long-term staff. So we have people who have been around a long time and they have good ideas too about what people may need in their homes. And um, our staff also, we have the seven offices throughout the state. And if somebody in homebound, one of the nurses in homebound sees it, uh, you know, one of their participants needs something specific, really specific, they will call around and ask people if they have any experience in that and what suggestions they have. They're pretty um, pretty good about um, finding resources and finding items that may not normally be available around with our vendors. They have ways to find stuff anyway. Mm -hmm. So, what questions? I'm ready for questions. Sarah, I know you have questions. I don't see anything in the chat, but everyone feel free to, to chime in. Lillian, I don't hear any questions today. I'm surprised. I am too. Farrah, you must have questions. So I'm not not seeing anybody this is the last chance I'm okay absolutely so, happy to answer anything you might have or yeah. if you say i've left something out i'm absolutely happy to to um add it in okay well, lillian thanks for your time um i believe that um actually if you're okay with it i'm gonna uh, turn it over to you maybe to explain a little bit more about the APT program and um, the intent and the mission uh, of the APTAP program, APT program. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Did Jessica correct you? <laughs> APT. No, no, I just. <laughs> Well, yeah. thank y'all all, all so much. Um, CRS, VR, sale, I think the information you provided is valuable. We're so appreciative that you joined us today and worked through the technical issues with us behind the scenes. We appreciate that. Um, APTAT, for those of you who are not familiar with that, is a program that has been around for a while, but we rebranded about two years ago. Uh, APT stands for Accessing Potential Through Assistive Technology, and we are actually a program of the Alabama Department of Rehab Services. So the difference for us and the rehab engineers that you've heard our speakers discuss is that um, the rehab engineers are able to work with cons 
uh, participants of Department of Rehab Services, so you must be enrolled in services, whereas what APT-AT is able to do is open to anybody in the state. You do not have to be enrolled in ADRS services to receive any of the uh, services that we provide. So real quick, um, we'll go in more detail on what all of the services that we provide in our subsequent uh, webinars. So if you haven't registered for the Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday sessions on funding, please do that. And we'll give you some more information about APT-AT, but just a general gist of the things that we're able to do through our program is um, we do help manage with the DME reuse centers. Um, Lillian mentioned those. Those are located across the state and they recycle durable medical equipment. And you are able to contact that center, find out if they have equipment that you need and you can go pick it up for free. It's absolutely no cost to the end user to pick up the durable medical equipment that has been donated to their uh, organization. We're also able to provide trainings. Our goal is to increase knowledge of assistive technology. We, we know that the more people who know about assistive technology, the better it is for everyone in the state, and especially when service providers are able to learn more about assistive technology, then they're able to pass that information along and provide those services and connect participants with those services across the state. Um, we do help provide information and resources. So at any time, if you need information on assistive technology, you can email us at aptat at rehab.alabama.gov. And we hopefully can answer questions like, who would be a resource for this assistive technology? Do you have suggestions? I have this situation. Would you have suggestions on um, what type of assistive technology is available to help with this situation? or we could even help refer you over to services that are available. Um, and then also, if you have questions about some of the services that we provide, you're able to contact us and get answers on those. One of the major activities that we provide is short-term loans. So we have a lending library and our devices are available for short-term loan for up to 30 days. And that helps you try before you buy or um, helps you learn more about the assistive technology or it can be used as a temporary accommodation. And then we can also provide demonstrations. So we're really excited. We were able to open up a demonstration center here in Birmingham and individuals can schedule a time with us to come in and sit down with our experts and learn about the assistive technology one-on-one -on -one with us and help them make informed decisions. All right, so that's the quick gist. For more, see us the, the rest of the week. We hope that you are um, signed up for those sessions. And I'm gonna ask, are there any questions? It looks like the chat was a bumping. AptAT does not currently have a website, although you can find our contact information on that main ADRS website that I shared earlier, which is um, the rehab.alabama.gov. And then our inventory can be found on the website that Jessica shared, which is AL dot at for all dot com and let me see if there there's another question, question regarding, regarding um, top on cancer, cancer thermostats i've never used a talking thermostat so i haven't um i don't have the answer to that um jessica have you or kevin have you looked at i, I have not okay We'd have to look at that, David, and see if we can get an answer to you. Yeah, that's good. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe he was referring to what I was saying about, you know, um, thermostats that you can operate basically from your phone. They're not talking thermostats. It's just okay. that you can control a lot of things from your phone. And, you know, um, those Amazon people. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> They can do a lot of that too. You know, is it Siri? Siri played my favorite song or something. You can program them to do a lot of things too, right, Ashley? Oh yeah. And I think yeah. so really it's it's thermostats that basically essentially you can talk to. <clears throat> and those would be smart thermostats that you are communicating with either via your phone or um the smart speakers like 
Alexa, I can't say it too loud or she's going to activate <laughs> on my desk She'll chime in. <laughs> or Google Home and things like that. And I did change to the slide where you can get that uh, best contact information for us as well. Okay. Any other final thoughts that, that anyone has? Any, any questions? Um, if not, as Ashley um, mentioned, there's contact information. Feel free to reach out and would be glad to help in any way possible.